We are continuing with the best of the rest of this episode with a bunch more games from than last time, including several racing games and a couple fighting games, uh, including one that's actually part of a fairly big uh, name series, well, moderate name series. Speed Racers is a game that starts with its best foot forward, opening with an engaging and exciting race, and then proceeds to crash and wrap its Mach 5 around a tree with some very awkward, clumsy, and unpleasant action platforming sequences. I understand why they're there, if you've watched the show, as you know on top of the racing sequences are sequences between races where whatever the big bad of the rest of the next race are do their damnedest to undermine the Mach 5, or to murder Speed their Racer X, or have some other nasty, nefarious plot. And if you're doing a game based on the show, to a certain extent you have to cover both. The problem is you need to do, if you're going to do both, you need to do both well. And Radical Entertainment can't pull both off. They got the racing okay, the frame rate kind of chugs, but it works, it controls well. The platforming though is just abysmal. And that is where the thing, the problems lie. The platforming needs to be something kind of closer to, with how they have it animated and how presented, to something like a uh, Rolling Thunder or a Shinobi. I mean, yes, Speed is a teenager, he's not a super spy, but he ends up in super spy adventures and so, consequently, his control should reflect that. And it doesn't. And that thus, that part of the game suffers and brings everything to a screeching halt. Operation Thunderbolt feels like a Rambo arcade game without the license. You're going through combat environments, gunning down hordes of enemies, trying to rescue hostages and complete other objectives. On the one hand, that this makes sense, because it's a sequel to Operation Wolf which is actually a game that we've covered way, way back in the day in Nintendo Power. It's one of the earlier issues. I want to say like issue one or two of Nintendo Power. Um, however, it's got a problem. And the problem is that this game is absolutely a quarter muncher style light gun game, even to a wider extent than the um, NES version was. But this is a home port and it has limited continues and not really a way that I can find for extending that. I've said before, and we'll say it again and again until this stops being a thing. If I am playing a home port of an arcade game, I should be able to set the metaphorical dip switch to free play and get unlimited continues. And this game doesn't do that, and thus it is hurt because of it. Next up is uh, Fighter's History, a fighting game. And of the various non-Capcom and non-SNK fighting games I've played so far on the show, I've enjoyed Fighter's History the most. While the game, by default, sets its difficulty to easy, it is an easy difficulty that still poses a challenge. The point that easy difficulty can regularly take a match to three rounds, and not due to me being bad or button mashing instead of trying to play seriously or that sort of thing. It is a legitimately challenging, easy difficulty, and props to that. Even if I'm able to overcome all of the matches up to a particular point, um, or just go to three rounds and then win on the third round, the fact is, it still poses a challenge. And I didn't feel like the game, with terms of how it controlled the points I was facing, was being cheap or anything like that. It wasn't. didn't feel like it was reinforcing bad habits necessarily. It's also a game where I felt like I could do well with a grapple-style character, in this case, the judoka Ryoko. Um, I mean, she's the Zangief-style grappler. Uh, instead of being a big, burly Russian macho guy, um, it's a uh, inspired by a Russian mixed martial artist, basically, who got brought in to New Japan by... Um, about New Japan. Instead, it's based basically off of the protagonist of Yawawar, a, fas a fashionable judo girl, um, which is actually pretty damn awesome That to do, to do this sort of style shift. The controls are also responsive and incredibly intuitive, making this a super fun game to play. Um, and while this game got two sequels, I kind of wish we'd gotten more. ESPN Speed World has the beginnings of a good racing game. The controls are mostly simple and intuitive. The tracks... While basic, with two oval tracks and a road track to start, are straightforward to pick up and learn. Now the racing AI is alright. Where things fall apart is how the game handles pit stops, and with the length of the races, you will have to pit. 
So in order to go through a pit stop in a timely manner for a race, you need to mash the shoulder buttons in order to speed up refueling and changing tires, something that is not really clearly communicated in the game itself. That's unacceptable for a racing game, and I'll help with the fact that I never see opposing racers pit, which means that, well, you have to make pit stops in order to complete the race. AI racers don't. That means that taking a pit stop will always put you behind, as opposed to, you know, real-world races where everybody makes pit stops, and so you don't have to worry about, oh, if I take a pit stop, nobody else will, therefore it is a bad strategy to make pit stops, except the game forces you to do it. Yeah, this is this is a problem for a racing game. Now, Snow White and Happily Ever After plays a lot like an Amiga PC platformer, complete with Amiga Acceleration, where when you hold down a direction on the D-pad, you automatically start accelerating at an incredible speed, even if what you actually just want to do is keep moving in that direction at a steady pace. It makes movement very fidgety. It's especially frustrating considering the game's controls don't use the shoulder buttons on the Super Nintendo controller, when it would make perfect sense to use one of the shoulder buttons, for example, as a run button. Nomonaga's Ambition, Lord of Darkness, like the rest of the series, definitely fits in the category of the grand strategy game, much like a paradox title, um, with the level of complexity somewhat scaled down for the Super Nintendo, except with an interface that is not as well designed as the PC interface for Paradox's grand strategy games. As with other titles from Koei in this style, you either get this game with the manual or have a fac open on a tablet or on a laptop and, or browser, win browser window or something like that where you have that to reference to find out information about how to better play the game. Because this game doesn't surface the information you need to succeed well, very well. I kind of actually... Would love to see Koei revisit some of these games on a PC or alternatively, like contract out with like Paradox or something like that to have them say, hey, we want to make a, you know, Sengoku Jidai era Paradox style grand strategy game. I realize we're, we're technically competition, but how do we do that better? Something like that. Sink or Swim is a Lemmings clone that doesn't quite pull it off. The objective in each Lemmings level is clearly defined. Get the Lemmings from clearly marked point A to clearly marked point B, and you have a reasonable amount of time to do it. You can stop and think and plan. Sink or Swim does not communicate the information, which makes it difficult to really figure out what the hell I need to do on each level, which gets frustrating. Um, similarly, some levels have, well, a fairly longer time limit to figure out what the hell you need to do and some games have a super fast super tight time limit and if you don't get it done like super like within seconds then you die and have to start over again without any real communication of what you did wrong poor communication is a source of frustration if you don't like this is a situation where you really need to clearly mark what the hell players are trying to do and what your end objectives are. Um, particularly if you're doing a Lemming-style game. So, yeah. This is not worth your time. Mike. World Heroes 2 is a way more exciting and engaging fighting game than I expected, though it's not one without real issues. Probably the biggest problem of the game is the lack of inputs. It's effectively a three-button game. Punch, kick, and throw. Punch and kick are mapped to face buttons and throw to the shoulder buttons. Now, the Genesis with the stock controller and with the three buttons on the Neo Geo MBS cab, that's fine. But with so much open real estate on the Super Nintendo controller, it's frustrating. Even just splitting attacks off to light and heavy versions with throws still being mapped to the shoulder buttons, as with the stock controls, would have, all, would have, would have been fine. However, with how things stand here, this is actually kind of frustrating, and it caused me some frustration when I picked up the game initially. And also, if you're going to keep the controls that simplistic, at least spice up the animations with, like, a much more well-animated multi-hit combo, like with something with, like, what was done later with the, uh, um, with the Marvel games by Capcom. Hammerlock Wrestling, on the other hand, has a amazing 
pre presentation. It is tremendous. It's dynamic. It makes wrestling seem larger than life in a way that so many licensed wrestling games from the NES to where we are now on the Super Nintendo don't. Um, and it's, it's like a pro wrestling anime come to life. But on the other hand, that very same presentation makes the game incredibly disorienting and disjointed to play. It makes it very difficult to tell what I need to be doing to succeed, whether it's timing my grapples or landing my strikes. It's like if you took the mid-game cutscenes from Tecmo Ball and had them happen several times a play, every play, and, and instead of going full screen, going split screen and having them constantly happening then. I really wanted to like this game. I wanted to have a good third-party wrestling title on the Super Nintendo. Um, and I feel like this would be something that would be instead more entertaining for me to watch somebody else way play than to play on my own. Wild Guns is almost everything I want from an arcade port. It's really addictive arcade fun with fast running gun action that makes it feel like a behind the back old west metal slug. It's a game where once I got the hang of things, I could just pull down the fire button and unleash a fire hose of death on enemies. If I have one complaint about this game, it's that you don't have enough lives. I kind of wish this thing in the game to help keep things going longer, like getting hit break at your score combo and then getting hit again causing you to lose a life. This instead, for, for playing this game, made me want to pick up the remake, Wild Guns Reloaded, on modern consoles, Super Nintendo, Switch, that sort of thing, to see how that game compares. I kind of have a double pick of this episode. On the one hand, I really liked Wild Guns, um, though admittedly, my like of Wild Guns is a lot more in the sense of, okay, I want to pick up Wild Guns Reloaded, so I, in the home. So that that game fixes some of the issues that I had with the Super Nintendo version, making something a little more friendly for long-term play. Um, with Fighter's History coming in a very close second. And in fact, actually, I almost bump Fighter's History up more to a certain degree. Uh, honestly, both games are fantastic, and both games are one that you can play two-player with a roommate. One cooperatively, one competitively. Uh, Fighter's History might also really go well for dorm room play. Uh, for those of you who are picking up used video games to take back with you when going back to college. Um, honestly, both of them are going to be a really fun time and are definitely worth checking out. Next time, we continue with more of the best of the rest. We're getting a bit closer to the end now. enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>